So we are going to talk about Cayley's theorem using group actions. So let's suppose we have a group G that's acting on some set A, and we have an element G from the group. The first thing we're going to do is consider the map, I'm going to call it sigma, that goes from A to itself, defined by sigma of some element of this set being equal to G times A. So this G times A comes from that group action on A. What we're going to show is that this map sigma must be a bijection. And to do that, we're going to show that it has a two-sided inverse. So consider the inverse map, sigma inverse, going from A to A, where we take sigma inverse of A just being G inverse times A. We can see pretty immediately that these are going to be inverse maps, but we can also double check it. First of all, we want to have sigma of sigma inverse of A. This is going to be G times G inverse times A. We know that a group action is associative, so we can put this together. This is going to be G G inverse times A. Of course, that just becomes the identity, and E times A gives us A, which means we do get sigma of sigma inverse being the identity map. And we can do the exact same thing if we take sigma inverse of sigma of A. We're going to get G inverse G here, and then we'll again get that we have the identity map. That means that this sigma inverse is a two-sided inverse map of sigma. And we know that if a function has a two-sided inverse, then it must be bijective. You can check the video in the description for an explanation of that. Therefore, we know that this map sigma is a bijection. Now, the reason it's important that the map going from A to G times A is a bijection is that there's a special word we can use for a bijection that goes from A to itself, and that is called a permutation. In other words, when we go from A to G times A, what happens is that the elements in this set get permuted. They get switched around among each other. And that means that we can describe this as a permutation. So let's consider a map like this, but for an arbitrary element G in the group. It's going to look like phi going from the group to the symmetric group on the set A. So what this is saying is this map phi is a function that's going to take in an element of the group. And it's going to describe what is the permutation sigma. What is this bijection we talked about earlier for that specific element of the group. And of course, a permutation on the elements of A, by definition, that's going to be an element of the symmetric group on A. So this map phi is going to associate every element of the group with some phi of G, which is a permutation. And we want to define phi so that this permutation describes the map going from A to G times A. So if we take phi of g and apply it to some element of the set, we want that to be the same thing as g times a. So this equation right here defines the way that phi of g permutes every single element of the set. And so if we look at this for every a in a, that's going to give us a specific permutation associated with phi of g. For every element of the group, it describes the map from a to g times a. Now it turns out that because this G times A is a group action, this map phi is going to have some special properties. In particular, let's look at what happens when we take phi of a product. Suppose we're looking at phi of G times H for two elements of the group, and we apply that to A. Well, by the definition we have right here, that's going to be GH times A. But on the other hand, what if we take phi of G times phi of H times A. Well, these are both permutations. So when we do this, we're going to first look at phi of H times A, and then we'll take phi of G onto that. So phi of H times A, by definition, that's going to be H times A in the group action. So we want phi of G applied to this H times A. Remember that this is just an element of that original set A. So if we do this, again, using that same definition, what we're going to get is G times H times A. Now there's something important that comes from the fact that this is a group action. 
which is one of the parts of the definition of a group action, is that GH times A must be the same as G times H times A. That's the rule of associativity. So in this case, phi of GH times A is the same thing as phi of G phi of H times A. And therefore, because these two maps, phi of GH and phi of G phi of H, give the same result for every possible input, they are the same permutation. Phi of GH equals phi of G times phi of H. And that means that this is a group homomorphism. We're taking a map from the group G to the symmetric group with this homomorphism property. So this map gives us, for every single group action, a homomorphism from G into the symmetric group on A. To get to Cayley's theorem, we're going to look at a specific group action. And that is, for any group G, we're going to consider the group acting on itself by left multiplication. So what that means is that if we take some element of the group and we have it act on some element of this set, which is just G, we're going to say that G times H is just equal to GH in the group. Because group multiplication is itself associative, we know that this map is also going to be associative. If we took, for example, K times G times H, we'd be able to do the product in whatever order we want. And therefore, this is a well-defined group action. So this is also going to give us a homomorphism, but it's going to give us a specific type. Instead of going to the symmetric group on some arbitrary set A, it's going to go to the symmetric group on G. And we're going to have phi of G times H being the same as G times H. And this is actually GH in the group. Now, I'll note that when we look at a group action, G acting on G, this second instance of the group G, we treat this just like a set. This G right here, we're just looking at the set of elements that are in the group. And so when we look at this map over here, when we say the symmetric group on G, what we're saying is the symmetric group on the elements of G. So this phi of G times H, it's permuting the elements in the group. That's what this map is describing. So we know that this phi is a homomorphism. One question we could ask is, what is the kernel of phi? Well, the kernel of a homomorphism, by definition, is the set of elements in the first group that get mapped to the identity element in the second group. Now, the identity element in the symmetric group is the identity permutation. In other words, the element where, if we multiply it onto anything, we just get the same element back. So if we look at what that means in the case of this phi, the kernel is going to be the set of elements in the group such that phi of g times h, this permutation here, gives us the exact same element back. And that has to be true for every element in the group. So this is saying that for every element in the set g, applying the permutation phi of g just leaves it in the same place. And therefore, this is the identity permutation. It's the permutation that leaves everything the same. So what does it mean to have phi of g times h equal h? Well, we know by definition that phi of g times h is the same thing as gh. So we want gh to equal h. But this is just multiplication inside the group g. So we know that we could multiply on the right by h inverse on both sides. And if we do that, h h inverse is going to be the identity. So on the left, we just get g. And on the right, again, h h inverse gives us the identity element. What that's telling us is the only way we can have g h equals h in a group is if g is the identity. So remember, the kernel of phi is the set of elements in the group such that phi of g is the identity permutation. But for phi of g to be the identity permutation, it has to not permute anything, which means phi of g times h must be h. Now we know by definition that phi of g times h equals gh. So for this to be the identity permutation, we must have gh equals h, which means g is the identity. The conclusion here is that the kernel of phi only has one possible element. It's just the identity.
And now we're going to apply the first isomorphism theorem to this homomorphism phi. And the first isomorphism theorem says that G mod the kernel of phi is isomorphic to the image of phi. But let's take a look at what G mod the kernel of phi is. Remember that the kernel is just the identity element. And so if we look at this quotient group, all of the cosets are going to look like G times the set, which is just the identity. So all of these cosets are just going to look like elements of the group. And they're going to multiply in the same way. Which means that when we have G mod the identity set, this is just isomorphic to the original group, G. So instead of looking at G mod the kernel of phi, with a trivial kernel, we can just look at the group itself. And so we get that G is isomorphic to the image of phi. Now what is the image of phi? We don't know exactly what it is because we aren't sure how this group works. So we don't know about the structure and how it multiplies. But we know that the image of phi is going to be somewhere in the symmetric group. And in order for this to be an isomorphism, the image of phi also has to be a group. So by this isomorphism, the image of phi is a group that sits inside the symmetric group on G. And therefore our conclusion is that G is isomorphic to a subgroup of SG. And as we went through this process, we were just considering an arbitrary group G. It could have been any group. So the conclusion that we get here is that every group is isomorphic to some subgroup of a symmetric group. Or in other words, every group is isomorphic to a permutation group. So that is the result that's called Cayley's theorem. The way that we get Cayley's theorem is by realizing that if we look at all the elements of the group and imagine it as just one long list of every element of G, if we take some specific G and we multiply it onto all of those elements, what that does is it switches them around. It permutes them. And so we can think about every G as just being a permutation of the group elements. In fact, the reason it's a permutation, like we saw at the beginning, is that every element has to have a two-sided inverse. And therefore, multiplying G times H has to be a bijection. As a result, we can associate every single element of the group with an element of the symmetric group. In other words, just a permutation on the elements of G. And because one of the group axioms is that multiplication is associative, this phi of G has to be a homomorphism. And another consequence of every element having an inverse is that the only way we get the identity permutation, the permutation that leaves H in the same spot, is if we have G equals E. Because we know we can multiply by H inverse on the right. And that leads us to the conclusion that the kernel of this homomorphism is just the identity element, meaning when we apply the first isomorphism theorem, G mod the kernel of phi, that's just G mod the identity, which is the same as the original group. So now we know that every group is isomorphic to a subgroup of a symmetric group.